I'd like to thank everybody for attending. Uh, we are proud to host uh, Governor Kitzhaber and Dr. Crew this evening for our town hall meeting. We appreciate their coming out. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the process and the format for tonight's town hall meeting in a little bit, but first I'm going to turn it over to Superintendent Smith. Okay, I'm going to just welcome all of you. Thank you so much for being here tonight. We have kind of an unusual format. Um, and I would like to say, first of all, welcome to Governor John Kitzhaber and Dr. Rudy Crew, our Chief Education Officer for the State of Oregon, and please join me in welcoming them. And we're looking forward to this unique opportunity to have a conversation with them about the future of education in our state. Um, I'd also like to recognize and thank Principal Petra Callen, who's right here, who's the principal of Madison High School. <laughs> Petra, will you wave so we can tell to you? Thank you. Thanks, Petra. We also have a, a number of Portland Public School principals in the audience with us tonight. Will you all please stand and wave your hands and just let, let us know that you are here? Thank you. We have a member of another school board, um, a member, Greg Kintz, who's from the Vernonia School Board. Thank you for joining us, Greg. And we have Superintendent Karen Gray from the Park Rose School District, who I would like to recognize. And Gwen Sullivan, who is the president of our Portland Association of Teachers. Will you just stand and let us recognize you? Um, we also have interpreters with us this evening, and I'd like to invite our interpreters to come on up and identify themselves and introduce themselves. And actually, I'll let you have my microphone right here. We'll pass it along. Just go ahead and grab it and do your... Uh, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Dimas Diaz. I, yo soy un, I, I'm going to speak in Spanish for those that need Spanish interpretation. Mi nombre es Dimas Díaz, yo soy un uh, intérprete en español. Si usted necesita mi ayuda o necesitan que le interprete esta reunión de hoy, yo voy a estar allá atrás. Por favor, véanme para darle lo, los equipos. Tatiana Fro, Russian interpreter. Uh, я русский переводчик, если вам нужны услуги рус по русскому языку, пожалуйста, обращайтесь ко мне, я нахожусь позади комнаты. Спасибо. Chào quý vị, con sẽ là thông dịch viên tiếng Việt của quý vị trong buổi tối hôm nay. À, nếu quý vị có cần thiết về thông dịch viên tiếng Việt thì con sẽ ở cái cái bàn ở đằng kia. Hi, good evening. My name is Hong Liu. I am a Chinese interpreter. Hey, 你好，我是刘红，我是中文翻译。如果你需要帮忙的话，请告诉我，谢谢。Thank you. Good evening, I'm Isaac. I'm a speak Somali. Anybody who needs help with Somali, I can help them over there. Of Somali And the final comment I'd like to make before I hand it back to our chair to get us started is just um, a recognition of the governor and the tone he has set about the conversation about education in the state and, and the preparation for this legislative se uh, session that's been qualitatively different than anyone before it. Um, in the holistic look that he did at putting together his budget that really looked at all aspects of the budget, the um, public safety, health and human services, and a long-term view of how we are building back and reinvesting in education in this state so that as we enter this legislative session, we're talking about the how, not the why, of investing in education. We don't have to build the case about the importance of it. So I'm just going to say this has been um, a pleasure and a real partnership um, with the governor and with Dr. Crew in figuring out how we build back and place priority on education in this state. So we're really thrilled to have both of you here with us tonight. Um, back to you, Chair Belisle. Okay, thank you. So I just want to give a little um, information about tonight's town hall um, forum. If you have a question that you would like answered, um, there should be cards that you have to write down the question and submit them. And if you are a staff member that's collecting those cards, can you raise your hand? 
So look for these folks and they will get your questions um, up here. If you would like um, it to be the, the answer to be addressed specifically to you, so here's a question from John so-and-so. Um, please make sure that your name's on it. You don't have to write your name on the, your question, but if you want it addressed, addressed back to you so that you know your, it's your question, um, please make sure your name is on it. Um, and with that, uh, I again also want to reiterate that we welcome Governor and Dr. Crew here this evening. Um, and with that, we're going to start off with Dr. Kr or excuse me, um, Dr. Kitzhaber. <laughs> Too many doctors on that end of the table. Um, Dr. Kitzhaber, um, and he's going to make a couple remarks, and then we will get to um, the place where we begin asking questions. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if there are any legislators here. I just wanted to make sure we recognize them. I see a number of empty seats up there. hope that's not a statement about our relationship. Um, I do see David Reeves out here. David, you from the Oregon Education uh, Investment Board. And I don't know if there's any other members, but David's been doing a great deal of work, and thank you very much for coming. I'd like to take maybe five or six minutes at the beginning and set a, a, a context uh, uh, here. Um, I know we're going to be talking a lot about funding, uh, and um, I've been around uh, quite a while, and getting more money is not as easy as it sounds, uh, and I think uh, that it requires a really a, a strategic plan. And so I wanted to give you just sort of the bare bones of, of what I have in mind, what we've been trying to do, and then really looking forward to engaging uh, with you. Um, since uh, I was elected two years ago, I've been focused really on one very simple premise, and that's that every Oregonian deserves their shot at the American dream. And to me, that's a, a commitment to equity and opportunity. It's a commitment to jobs and, and job security. It's a commitment to safe, secure communities where people have a sense of belonging and common purpose and concern for one another. And if, as I believe, that the, at the heart of the American dream is the promise of opportunity, the promise of upward mobility, the promise that hard work gets rewarded and that you can actually leave your kids better off than you are, then public education is the vehicle through which that promise is most directly fulfilled today. So everything we've been doing over the last two years is part of a long-term plan to restore and revitalize uh, public education in the state of Oregon. And to be successful, we've got to recognize that this isn't a one or two year job. This is a six or seven or eight year job. And so we have to move beyond the myopic, myopic focus of just how much money we put into schools each year, which is very important, and we will definitely come back to that. But we also have to ask ourselves how the decisions we made in the last two years and the decisions we're going to make this year and next year and the year after that actually help move us towards uh, uh, the, the kind of system that we want. And I'd like to provide a little context by telling you a bit of my personal history, which I think uh, provides an interesting context to, of what we're, we're doing here today. Um, although I have uh, 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 long, deep roots here in Oregon, one of my ancestors came here across the Oregon Trail in the 1800s. I wasn't born here. I was born across the river in Colfax and ended up in Lawrence, Kansas via Pullman and Seattle and Logan, Utah, which is another story, uh, at a very early age where my father was teaching English at the uh, University of Kansas in Lawrence. And in October of 1957, uh, the Russians launched uh, Sputnik into orbit around the Earth. And to me, this was pretty darn amazing. I can still remember sitting with my mother in our little ranch house on the floor watching coverage of this event on the very first television we owned, which is a little black and white box with rabbit ears that we bought just to have opportunity to look at this. And I can remember going out and looking up in wonder at this little speck of light going across the, the broad Kansas sky. And to me, this was amazing. And to America, it was terribly frightening and disconcerting because it, in the depth of the Cold War, it meant that Russian rocketry was, was ahead of ours. And so what happened was this, this tremendous effort to revamp our curriculum in this country with a special focus on, uh, on math and science. Sound familiar? Uh, mostly to get ahead of the Russians in the Cold War. And as a part of that, the Portland public school system embarked upon a reevaluation of its high school curriculum, and they sent out a, a, a request for someone to come and uh, run the project, and my father applied and was actually hired. And so we ended up here in 1958. That's how we escaped from Kansas. And having looked at Kansas and looked at Oregon, I, the whole statement, uh, Dora, this, this isn't Kansas anymore, has a new and refreshing meaning for me. Um, and he produced uh, something called the Kitsaba Report on uh, the high school curriculum in the Portland public school system in 1959. That was over 50 years ago. 
Uh, and I, I uh, read a little paper that he left in his papers here about three months ago called The Short Happy Life of the Sputnik Education Reform Movement. And here we are again 50 years later uh, re looking at our, our curriculum and looking at how we teach and, and learn and with again an emphasis on science and math and technology because of the importance of technology in our society and because we're not turning out enough engineers. Well, I think that there are lots of good reasons to keep up with major international competitors like the Chinese, but I also think that there's a more important reason to reevaluate our educational system, and that has everything to do with rebuilding the middle class in this country. And, and you know, the fact is there's a growing correlation between educational attainment and economic attainment, and upward income mobility, and a pathway to the, to the middle class. When I was first elected from Douglas County in 1978, kids dropped out of Roseburg High School in the 10th and 11th grade and got great jobs in the mills and in the woods with good benefits and the expectation that that would last all their lives. Well, those days are gone forever. Today we know that uh, a high school uh, graduate and a college graduate, when you compare their income level in 1978, the high school college graduate made 35% more, today it's 75% more. And we also know that most of the jobs we're going to create are going to require some kind of post-secondary education, at least a technical certificate or an or a, uh, associate's degree. So what we've embarked upon over the last two years is nothing short of a committed, intentional, uh, eight to ten year plan to restore and revitalize public education in Oregon that's built around a very strong vision. And the fact that we have a vision is what I think is going to make this different than the short, happy life of the Sputnik education reform movement in the past or the one we had in the 1990s when we developed the SIM and the CAM. And that vision, that North Star, we call 40-40-20. And, and it's aspirational. It's extraordinary, but it's very aspirational. And what it says is that by 2025, we're going to have a 100% high school graduation rate in Oregon. In other words, when the children who entered kindergarten last September graduate from high school, all of them are going to graduate from high school. And that 40% will get at least two years of post-secondary education and training, and another 40% will get at least a baccalaureate degree or higher. Now, that vision is not just a bunch of numerical targets. It's based on a belief and a commitment. And the belief is that every student in this state can succeed. It's a belief that every student, regardless of their home language, their income, their ethnicity, their immigration status, has the potential to succeed. And the commitment is a commitment by adults to those students. Not just parents and teachers administrators, but every adult in Oregon has to commit to meet those young people where they are and develop a pathway to success in college and career. That's what it's about. And I believe that there are three major obstacles to achieving th this vision. The first obstacle is this pattern of disinvestment that's been going on for a decade in the Oregon General Fund, where we're spending more and more money on health care and public safety and less and less on children, families, and education. And we've got to turn that around. The second obstacle is, I think, the structure of our system of public education, which I don't think was designed for the realities of the 21st century. And it wasn't built around the, the, you know, the outcomes necessary for success. And the third one is that the system is absolutely underfunded at, at every level. Those are the three obstacles. And so our, our, our effort has to address all, all three of those. And I think that it will take between at least three biennia to set this state on a trajectory to actually make the 40-40-20 vision a reality. So the first biennial was the one we're just finishing, 2011-13. The next one is the one we're entering, 13-15, and the one that's following that is the 15-17. Is the and I want to just, re before we get into the conversation, I want to tell you sort of what the objectives were for the last two years and how we did, and what the objectives are for this two years, and then the objectives for 15-17. For so the objectives in the 2011-13 biennium started with the fact that we faced a three and a half billion dollar revenue shortfall in this state and our education budget was propped up with a lot of one-time money from bonding to money from the stimulus. So the first objective was to balance the budget and to get the one-time money out of our educational system so we had a solid funding base for our schools. The second one was to try to break down the silos that exist and, and stop looking at education as kindergarten and K through 12 and community colleges and universities, but rather a zero through 20 uh, continuum. The third was to develop an effective early childhood uh, service and educational delivery program because right now we bake in achievement compacts before kids, I mean, uh, achievement uh, uh, get gap before kids ever get to, to school. We don't have a very effective or outcomes-based system of early childhood. There are some good elements to it, but it's not a system. 
The third one was to get waivers from No Child Left Behind to allow us to develop our own supportive method of school evaluation and, uh, and uh, accountability. The uh, next one was to begin to transform our healthcare system, to bend down the cost curve, to free up resources to invest in education. And the last one was to try to rebuild the business labor coalition that was torn apart with 66 and 67 as a first step in revisiting the whole question of public finance in the state of Oregon. So how did we do? We went from a $3.5 billion budget deficit to a balanced budget today that's a little bit actually on the, on, on the upside. Uh, we um, took all the one to, almost all the one-time money out of, our, out of our educational budget. Uh, we have uh, designed a new early learning uh, a program that we hope to implement uh, this year, a performance-based program. We achieved waivers from No Child Left Behind and have developed our achievement compacts as a step towards that new system of evaluation and accountability. We, we have begun to uh, transform our healthcare system and have in place now coordinated care organizations providing uh, healthcare services to 600,000 people on the Oregon Health Plan. We received almost $2 billion from the federal government towards that effort and broad flexibility in how we designed that system. We received a $20 million Race to the Top uh, Early Childhood Challenge Grant to uh, support our early uh, childhood efforts. And finally, we have uh, rebuilt, I think, to a large extent, that important coalition. Uh, they have uh, done polling, joint polling, and focus groups, uh, and uh, are uh, prepared to, 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 to move forward. So that's actually quite a bit in two years, uh, and I think we should feel proud about that. Now, in the current biennium, we have a number of objectives, and this gets right to the heart of the funding question. First of all, we have to continue to implement the health care model. Uh, that has saved us $100 million this biennium. It will save us $200 million next biennium and $400 million in the 17-19 or 17, 19 biennium. It, and the second thing we need to do is, with our health insurance exchange, lay the groundwork for uh, teachers and public employees for OEB and PEB to have the option of choosing this high quality, low uh, cost uh, option for their health care. If state employees, if, if OEB and PEB basically were in a health care delivery model that grew at 3.4% a year, which is our commitment to the federal government, the 10 year savings are $5 billion. That's another billion dollars in the general fund per biennium. It's not pocket change. Secondly, we have to take on reforms in our public safety system to avoid building another. Uh, 2,300 beds at the cost of, of $600 million over the next 10 years. So health care and public safety reforms have everything to do with school funding. They free up resources on the back end to invest on the front end. We need to, um, we hope to pilot a regional achievement compacts in, as a way to really engage the larger community in supporting uh, our school system. We need to launch our performance-based early childhood uh, initiative. And finally, we, we, we need, need to begin to reinvest uh, to stabilize our school system through a combination of general fund, uh, savings from, um, from uh, health care, uh, and some changes to PERS, which we, uh, I'm sure we'll talk about. The um, co-chair's budget has uh, uh, a school number for K through 12 at 6.75 billion, uh, which um, for most districts will allow us to begin to turn the corner uh, on the cuts that we've been experiencing over the last five years. I think it's absolutely important that we hit that number, and I'm very committed to working with the legislature to make sure that we, uh, we do, do so. And then finally, the Business Labor Coalition needs to produce a proposal, uh, a, a time frame, and a budget. Um, that's the, the, the short list of uh, things we want to get done here in uh, this biennium. And then finally, the, 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 uh, the, the final biennium, the 15-17 uh, biennium, hopefully, uh, with uh, a revisitation uh, in 14 or early 15 of our system of public finance of the accelerating savings from health care and public safety changes, we can develop a true education growth budget uh, funded with real dollars, not one-time dollars, that can allow us to um, uh, make the kinds of investments uh, that are necessary uh, in, in uh, our, our, our uh, education continuum uh, to achieve those 40-40-20 uh, objectives. So I know that's a long introduction, but I think it's really important to recognize that um, you know, what, what we've done many times and what I've done many times in the past as a member of the legislature is to come in and view each biennium as a separate two-year um, budget balancing exercise rather than a strategic set of building blocks to move us towards our goal. So it takes a lot of discipline to do this. I think we're well on the way, uh, and I'm looking forward to working with you um, uh, to, uh, to get there. Uh, I have just received a note from the, from, the, from the front office, Senator Jackie Dingfelder has arrived. Senator? 
and Representative Michael Dembro, a key player in the educational debate. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. So, so with that, um, we've set aside some time. The board members have some questions, and then we'll open up to the field. Just a reminder um, that if you have a question, make sure to write it down, wave it up in the air. One of the staff members will be around to pick it up because we're only accepting written um, questions. I also want to let people know, I forgot to mention this, that we are streaming live both on channel 28 as well as on the internet, um, our website. Um, and just a reminder for those who are watching us via the website that you can still submit questions via PPS's Facebook page. Um, those will be incorporated into, into our work here today as well. Um, so with that, we are going to move on to some questions from our board, uh, Governor Kitzhaber. With that, I'll turn it over to Co-Chair Gonzalez. And, and just to add a little bit more to the context to what Governor, uh, you said, uh, you know, in December you proposed a budget that was an increase over the previous biennials budget. Um, but with all due respect, we have resulted in significant cuts in education, at least uh, from what we have seen. And we have been, you know, fiercely advocating for increased budget during this legislative session, and then we are heartened by the increase proposed to set 6.75 billion uh, by the co-chair's budget. Uh, however, even this increase will simply maintain the program we're offering today and really won't allow us to be, truly begin to invest in students. Uh, so, Governor, do you think that the legislative leaders have moved in the right direction with the state school fund? And do you support their increase over your proposed budget? I definitely think they're moving in the right direction and I do support the increase over the budget. I think that the objective this, this year is to essentially stop the hemorrhaging, if you will, of teachers and school days to set the platform for a deeper reinvestment. I think you do need to recognize that this isn't going to be easy uh, because um, uh, the co-chair's budget calls for about $275 million in new revenue, which I'm very supportive of. That does require a supermajority. It requires uh, 36 votes in the, in, the, in the House and it requires 18 votes in the Senate. So this budget cannot be passed uh, without su some re uh, support from the Republican caucus. So I think it's very, very important that we begin very, very soon to have serious sit-down meetings between the House and the Senate and the Republican and Democratic leadership about how we're going to put this uh, together. It's very, it's doable, it's possible, uh, and, uh, and I'm very supportive of the direction that they're moving in. Governor and Dr. Crew, thank you so much for being here today. Just following up a little bit with some background, I'm an Oregon native and a graduate of our public school system, as are my three sons. And I believe, like you do, and uh, it influenced my decision to run for the board, that education is the key to success for every child. And I do mean every child. Um, so following up on that, I'm going to ask that short-term question instead of the long one. Um, I recently returned from the Council of Great City Schools meeting in Washington, D.C. Sequestration was what was on the top of the list at the conference and its effects on early childhood, special education, pre-K, English language learners, and on and on and on. All of these programs are supported by federal dollars through Title I, II, and III. I'd like to ask you about how you see us minimizing the impact of the federal cuts that we are likely to face from the sequester. It's, if it is fully implemented, Portland Public Schools will see at least $2.5 million in cuts to our programs like Head Start and Special Education and Early Childhood. And many of these programs have rules that prevent us from backfilling them with the general fund dollars. So Governor, does the state have a plan for responding to these very damaging federal cuts? Well, as you pointed out, um, some of these um, uh, programs have federal restrictions around them that, that sort of tie the, the state's uh, hands. I mean, should the sequester go forward, I, um, clearly I think that we have to have a discussion in the legislature about to the extent that we can do some backfilling, you know, um, uh, how we would go about that, particularly in the early childhood special education space. But I think the most important thing that for us to remember is the sequester is an example of failed governance. It should never have happened and it shouldn't go forward. And the fact of the matter is that the cuts that they're looking at, the, the $1.2 trillion in cuts, are restricted to defense 
and what's called non-security discretionary domestic spending, which is 19% of the federal budget and includes everything that's important, education, transportation service, transportation infrastructure, research and development, it is mindless. And I, I have said before and I will say again that if every state in this country adopted the care model that we've developed here in Oregon for their Medicaid program and for the dual eligibles, the savings is about $1.5 trillion over five years, reducing costs, making people healthier. So I think we just need to continue to raise our voices to our congressional delegation uh, and to the president and to the leadership of Congress that this is not acceptable. This is a, a, a fail, failure of governance. It's no way to uh, run uh, the show. Governor Kitzhopper, it's Bobby Regan. I'm the longest serving member of the Portland School Board and I'm also I'm the executive part of the Oregon School Boards Association. So I want to thank you, first of all, for your um, previous remarks about the need for broad-based tax reform in Oregon to put the state on more uh, secure revenue footing. And we're very open to that conversation. In the meantime, Portland Public Schools has been advocating for modest reforms to our property tax system that would begin to bring some measure of rationality to our broken system as well. We're specifically calling on the legislature to send to voters two measures. One would deal with local option levies and the fact that they don't collect the full amount that voters approve due to compression. And the other would reset property values at the point of sale while maintaining caps for growth of value for uh, homeowners. So, Governor, do you support uh, these efforts and in what way can you help us encourage legislators to put the question to voters? I think the, I think the, the real issue is the second part of your question. I'm very supportive <laughs> of both those measures. I just met with the League of Oregon Cities just today on this you know, thing, well over half of our cities are in compression. And you, know, it's, 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 you can view it in a lot of ways. I, I think you can view it as a jobs issue. You know, if you don't have basic infrastructure in your cities and counties, it's pretty hard to get companies to expand or to come in there. So it, it, it makes sense on a lot of, a lot of levels. The, there seems to be a reluctance uh, to even vote these things to the voters, which I have uh, real trouble understanding. No one's imposing a, a tax on anyone. We're simply giving people the opportunity to be heard on these two constitutional measures. So I will continue to be a vocal advocate of those. I think we need to, um, um, you know, lean on the committees where those votes, those bills are, at least get them out to the floor and let them die up or down on the floor rather than languish in committees because this is a problem that's not going to go away uh, and uh, it really is, uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, an, an, an impediment to the long-term vision that we're trying to achieve. Governor, thanks so much, uh, Ruth Atkins. I wanted to just actually then turn to the longer term question of broader tax reform in addition to the, 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 the pieces that are on this year's um, legislative agenda. Can you give us more specifics? I mean, really there is this sense of not just urgency, but I think desperation for that vision and leadership to get us to a more sensible tax system. So I know you've been engaged with in discussions with business and labor, but can you give us more of a some more specifics or more of a sense of when you're going to be, um, what you're looking for in terms of a long-term vision, and how we as the public and community can support you in that and get, it, get us there. So um, it's, a, it's a very uh, interesting uh, question. I've been involved in two major efforts to reform our tax system. Probably the best crafted bill was the 1985 sales tax proposal that was locked in the Constitution and reduced uh, income taxes for every dollar of sales tax, and I think it uh, lost four to one. Uh, so my efforts have been spectacularly unsuccessful. Um, but we do have to take a run at it again. And I think they, uh, what may make this different, hopefully will make this different, is I think what happened in the last time is the, 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 the um, you know, labor and business and the folks who fund these sorts of campaigns got together and put down what they thought made sense without really checking to what people uh, who have to vote on it thought was important and there was a they did some very interesting polling and focus groups and it was a real wake-up call that the things that labor thought people were ready to vote for and the things that business thought people were ready to vote for really didn't make much difference so for example there was a lot of support for a, a reduction in our capital gains tax uh, most Oregonians don't know what it is don't really care one way or another you could tack it on to something else but right now people are really concerned about more immediate sort of Maslow hierarchies things like you know where's the next meal going to come from and you know where's you know what's going to happen to my job so what we're doing is a very deep dive over the next six months to really find out what the pathway is without a preconceived mm -hmm. you know measure uh, but obviously we want to do three, at least three things we want to make sure that we 
uh, have a, 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 a progressive and equitable system, and we want to make sure that our system is stable, more stable than it is right now, and we want to make sure that the uh, tax code reflects the kinds of economic activity that we want to produce in the state. But so we're hoping to have something um, by early or midsummer that we could actually look at as a proposal. Then we have. Then I think it's really a strategic question of of uh, how we, uh, you know, when we put it on the ballot and and what that campaign looks like. I'll just close by saying I in the same box of papers that I found my father's. A story about this Sputnik reform movement, I found the uh, entire campaign for the 1985 uh, ballot measure, which was a comic book uh, produced by, I think Mark Nelson was hired to run the campaign. It literally is a comic book. And we kicked this out in uh, of the legislature in March, and it went on the ballot in September, and we circulated this comic book, and we lost four to one. Before I ask my question, uh, Representative Alyssa Kenny Geyer has arrived. Hello, welcome. So, Governor and Dr. Crew, you have asked uh, to be allocated funds to strategically target investments to help improve student achievement. Can you give us a sense of how these targeted investments will help a district like ours, which is right around 45% students of color and growing rapidly, close our racial achievement gap? I'm going to just take a, set the tone and I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Crew. I'm really glad there's a question here that uh, was directed to both of us because we hired him to, to work, not to just sit there in the corner. <laughs> so I think you need to understand, if you look at the magnitude, um, uh, I think we need to separate the, the, the $120 million we were hoping to get for uh, teacher, teacher quality. That's very, very important, foundational. But the money that's actually in the budget at this point is about $38, $38 million for third grade reading for post-secondary uh, aspirations for uh, underserved, particularly students, sixth to 10th grade who are at likely to fail or drop out, and then science, technology, engineering, arts, and, and math. So obviously, if with a $6.75 billion budget, 38 million is not a whole lot, and we're not gonna be able to allocate that to every district. The idea is to use that essentially as seed money to t pick a few places where we believe we can really move the dial uh, by changing the way we approach these issues. So the idea is, taking a small amount of money that doesn't just sustain the current system, it seeks to transform it and demonstrates that where you focus money, you get real results to help us make the larger case, not just to the education community, but to larger, the larger population that ultimately is gonna to have to vote on the revenue reform measure that this is a system worth funding and if we target these, these investments, we can really move the dial on student achievement. The, it, I, I think that if I were um, still a, a superintendent, um, and somebody said, here's some additional monies off on the side, not part of my regular funding base, but here's some additional money, and I want you to choose things that you would want to do, but you essentially don't have the startup money to do them. I, I would, particularly if it was in the area of wanting to focus on low achieving or underachieving students, There'd be a couple of features to this notion that I would be serious about. One, who's in this ball game with me? Who could I get to partner with me? What university, what business, what philanthropy? Who is it that actually has a track record at doing some of this work and actually doing it fairly well? Secondly, where do I get a bang for the buck? Where do I actually get something which I, if I do this, I'm gonna see a return rather quickly? Now that second category, in my mind, leaves open a variety of areas that one could actually sort of select. You could actually spend some time uh, on the early learning side of this and say, wow, we're gonna spend a lot of money being able to invest in kids who come to school without pre-literacy skills at all. I would argue that would be an area for closing the achievement gap that you will get a bang for the buck right off the bat literally working with families and children and focusing on pre-literacy skills, the likes of which they walk in the door and then have versus didn't have in the prior, in the prior term. A second area for discussion, if you will, would be, you know, I, I would argue that there are an awful lot of kids who, when you talk about this third grade reading issue, there are an awful lot of kids who are right, right on the cusp of being able to be third grade readers, but for the fact that they really need more time. 
And in some of the lowest performing schools, what they really need fundamentally is a different structure of time, maybe a different day, maybe a different year, maybe a different use of summer, maybe a different, way, but a different utilization of time. Different, if you will, opportunities for teachers and for students and parents to really get together, plan. Um, in New York and other places, we did libraries, uh, in school libraries, uh, the city libraries as an extension of the day, and so on and so forth. So I guess I would say to you that you know you can pick lots of areas. Carol and I had a conversation not too long ago about really onboarding, if you will, brand new students, particularly young women and particularly students of color who heretofore are not doing very well in science, have a notoriously bad record of doing well in math and science, and as a result, there's absolutely no way, no matter how much STEM opportunities we provide, if they don't have foundational skills in this, they're not ever gonna be able to even onboard, even with the best of intentions. So we had been talking about, you know, where and who are the partners, potentially, that would essentially help us at being able to do this. So I think that this is, as the governor said, this is seed money. It's not intended to be the full Monty. There's really an opportunity for us to kind of think about this as money that would actually give birth to ideas and strategies that heretofore we either know work, would build collaboration, and ultimately give us an opportunity to focus in on places where we think we can get a real good return for that in terms of student performance. Trudy Sargent. Um, I'm at the end of my second term on the school board after eight years and I'm not running for re-election, so I'm in my last few months of service here. And um, I want to ask you a little bit about uh, your budget um, and our budget. At PPS and in most school districts, the cost of employee retirement, as you've talked about, is very high. It's approaching 25% of payroll combined with health care and other benefits, and it, it exceeds 50% of an employee's compensation. So both health care and pension benefits are protected to increase at a rate vastly in excess of the rate that tax revenues are projected to increase over the coming years. Um, and you've talked a little bit about PERS. I'm going to go to the health care issue and ask you about the Oregon Education Benefits Plan that was created in 2007 to control rising cost of employee health insurance to, to school districts. Um, and if that, that plan has not met its goal of controlling skyrocketing cost of health insurance. In fact, the premiums have increased more rapidly than the premiums under the Portland Public Schools Health Insurance Trust, which we still have in this district. So I have a two-part question for you. One would be, would you support allowing districts to opt out of that plan if they can offer their employees health insurance at a more cost-effective rate? Well, or two, and you started a little bit in your comments earlier about can you elaborate on your thoughts about reforming OEB so that we can really bend that, um, that cost curve down and talk about a cost, rate of cost increase that would be more similar to the rate that we're going to see in our tax revenues so that that isn't um, causing the reduction in the programs that we can offer in our district? Yeah, I, I think, you know, to the, the, there's, a, there's a big uh, and sort of a relentless drumbeat about the public employer's retirement system, but healthcare is a much bigger much, much bigger cost, and it's growing a lot faster. So I think it's important to put that into perspective. Um, so the state revenue is growing at about 4.5% a year. Uh, Health care is growing at about 5.4% uh, a year. So you can, you can just do the best. It's overall uh, it's just the Medicaid. So the state has two responsibilities. One is obviously uh, the, the social safety net through, through, through Medicaid. That's 600,000 people. We also purchase health care for... Uh, if you include school teachers, as, as since we're uh, obviously 70% state funded, and our, our state workers, it's about another 300,000 people. So in answer to your first question, I would not support opting out because that helps you in the short term, but it decreases the purchasing pool, uh, which is what's going to actually drive change in the delivery system. That is, uh, what the, um, with the, assuming that the CCOs are, uh, uh, meet their health outcome and cost reduction metrics and the commitment to the federal government is we'll be growing at 3.4 percent at the end of next year and that will continue to grow just at 3.4 percent into the future. Um, that's six, that's 600,000 people. That's, uh, that's basically about 20 percent of the insurance market. It's a pretty big dog. When you add 
uh, uh, OAB and PEB in there, we've got one out of every four covered lives in Oregon is in that purchasing pool. So the idea is to then offer uh, on the exchange uh, a, a, the, a similar care model as a low cost, high quality option for school teachers and public employees. We've had extensive conversations with SEIU on this. They're very interested in looking at it. They, they recognize that the cost of health care is squeezing out wages and all sorts of that. It's not, it's that so it's a, everybody has an interest in this. And so I'm very concerned. I just went through this with the Oregon University system. If we basically fragment that purchasing pool, we're not going to have any kind of leverage, purchasing leverage, to actually force the kinds of changes that we want. In addition, um, if we reduce costs on the public side, these, those costs will be shifted to private employers through increases in their premiums unless they also align their purchasing uh, uh, patterns with those of the state. So this is a pretty intentional effort to really get our arms around health care costs in the state of Oregon. And so far, it's, it's going very well. And by the end of this month, we should actually have some outcome metrics which will, uh, uh, which obviously people are interested in if they want to get into a, 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 a new care model, they want to know that it's going to work. Uh, thank you. I, I appreciate that, and, and, um, and I'm encouraged uh, by your plans. As, a, um, as an employer and as a self-employed person, I buy my health insurance individually. I'm wondering where in the picture there might be opportunities for individuals um, because honestly, health care for small businesses and for individuals is very expensive, very difficult to get as well. Um, and so where in your plan here that will take some time to roll out, will there be a place for individuals and small businesses? So um, I have the numbers here, but I probably can't find them. I just had a conversation about this the other day. In next year, um, because of the Affordable Care Act, we'll be adding um, uh, uh, about 180,000 <clears throat> people who will become eligible for the Medicaid program. So they're going to push the income level up. And basically, uh, individuals and small groups will be able to go onto the exchange. And there's a whole host of subsidies uh, uh, to help the smaller businesses. What you're going to see initially in April, you're going to see a big rate bump uh, in the small and individual market because you're taking all these people who have been in high risk pools or weren't covered, and now they all have coverage. And so we're going to have to. Uh, do some reinsurance and some other things to try to mitigate that cost for about two years until the system stabilizes. But at the end, we'll have essentially a, a giant community-rated system which will work like insurance ought to work. You know, if you, if you look at uh, home insurance or car insurance, you're insuring against something you don't think is going to happen. You don't think your house is going to burn down. And so everybody pays a little bit, and then if your house burn down, burns down, you, you know, that pool of funds re re repaying your house. With health care, we're funding, uh, actually buying insurance for something we know is going to happen. We're all going to get old. We're all going to get chronic diseases. And the game in, in many parts of the insurance industry isn't spreading risk. It's avoiding risk uh, or, or, uh, or shifting risk. That's why some companies dropped kids when the ACA said you had to drop, you know. Pre pre so this, the, with the changes in the ACA, that will change that. And uh, if you go onto the website for the State Health Insurance Exchange, you can actually get the, the detail on uh, the roll-in of the small group and individuals. Thank you. And before we get to our final question um, with our student representative, um, Garcia, um, again, just a reminder, folks, that um, if you have questions, write them down as you're hearing uh, the governor and Dr. Crew talk. Write them down, wave them around, staff will come by, and we'll get them up here so our student panels can, can read your question. Um, but I just wanted to ask real quick before, before we move on to student representative Garcia's question, you, you briefly mentioned PERS, and there's a lot of discussion, as you mentioned, it's getting a lot more attention than health care. Um, can you talk about whether or not um, the current legislative proposal goes far enough in your perspective to give us long-term sustainability, how that fits into your 10-year plan, um, and how you're working with organizations like the Oregon School Board Association, which we're a member of, um, to, com to, find, to come to a solution? Because it's, it's not easy compromise. No, it's not easy at all. And, um, um, you know, it's uh, speaking as a Tier 1 public employee retiree, um, the, so here's the, I mean, here's the situation, and I think people can argue with this, but here's, I didn't just wake up one morning last summer and say, oh, let's do something about PERS. I met with the leadership of every public union in Oregon from uh, OEA to nurses to firefighters to SEIU, et cetera, and said, we have a, a cost problem and we need to figure out how to do something about it. I also met four times with the PERS coalition and uh, was looking for alternatives. Here's the situation, and this is not a pejorative, it's nobody's fault, it just is what it is because of the, the market crash in 2008 and the loss of value, 
that increases employer contributions. And um, in, uh, there, there will be a, a, about a $1,000 increase per pupil in our public school system over the next year, and about half of that is the PERS increase, and there are other benefits that account for the rest of it. So my point is that the, the, the crisis in school funding and the crisis in funding things like protective services for kids and, and important other elements of our safety net is no longer just a revenue problem. It is certainly a revenue problem, but it's also a cost problem. And the question is how you can balance the retirement system uh, in a way that still allows you to make investments in the classroom today to ensure that those students are, are, are successful tomorrow. Uh, I don't question that it's a commitment. Uh, it's, it's simply a matter of sustainability and having the free board to, to make some investments. And uh, uh, so my proposal uh, attempted to uh, have retirees contribute to the solution, whereas most of the things that have happened have been on the backs of uh, current workers. Uh, and, you know, many of them are funding a retirement system they're not going to see. So I am not too sanguine about a lot of the elements of the school board proposal because they uh, sort of w whack uh, existing workers who, you know, quite frankly, have been whacked enough, and they're working really hard, they're stressed out, they're, you know, in the classroom, uh, the people were just overloaded with uh, child protective cases, and we have to remember that. So I thought that, you know, we, that, that, I, that since two-thirds of the costs in the system are the legacy costs of folks who retired, that's why I went there. Um, my proposal uh, reduces the unfunded actuarial liability by about 25 percent, so it really does take a big bite out of the long-term problem, and I would craft it in a way that as the UAL goes down, the COLA comes back, because this is really trying to work through this extraordinary event that happened in 2008. The legislature uh, ha has essentially, uh, I think theirs is about 450 million, as opposed to 850, and what they did is they, they took the rates, the, the, they, what's called collaring right now, we have a 5% rate increase, and then there's supposed to be a 2% next biennium. They're proposing three, three, and one, so you're pushing some of the rate increase down the road a bit, uh, but at the same time. So that gets, the, on the PERS piece, that's about the same dollar figure as the one I put on the table, but they added about, you know, three or four hundred million dollars to K-12 to, 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 to budget, which I'm very supportive of. Um, there's about a hundred and twenty million dollar unfunded hole in human resources and 40 in corrections that we don't know about, and then 275 million dollars we have to get some Republicans to vote for. So I, I just think it's important to put the PERS thing into perspective. Fixing the, the, the retirement system doesn't fix all the problems that face public schools in the state of Oregon. I think there's some prudent things we can do, but we need to recognize that these, this isn't about the value or quality uh, of, our, of, our, of our teachers or our public sector workforce. I see a sign over there, and let me speak to it, cut corporate tax loopholes. Um, there are, in my estimation, on the revenue side, that we need to do something that is very progressive that balances this out. And the three things I've proposed, and whether the legislature will do them or not, I don't know, is uh, reducing the Schedule A deductibility on your federal income tax form. It's 100% now. If you begin to reduce that to 90% or 85%, or that is a progressive reduction. And uh, capping uh, the, uh, the, the total deductions at a certain dollar a figure. And the third one I put on the table, uh, and I may not, never get out of here live, is capping what's called the senior uh, medical deductible deduction. And right now, uh, if when you turn 65, whether you are making uh, $40 million a year or $20,000 a year, you get to deduct 100% of your medical expenses. It seems to me that in these extraordinary times, uh, means testing, that might be a way to do it. So I think your, your point is right. We need, to, we need to have a balance. I know that the, the legislative co-chair's budget seeks to, to strike that. They haven't yet rolled out what that, where that 275 is going to come from. But uh, I, think, uh, I think that we're, you know, I think the ultimate trade-off to make this legislature and this budget work is, the, is PERS, ver, PERS and the, the revenue. What that balance is, I don't know, but that's where the sweet spot's going to be and what's going to get us out of the building, hopefully with the resources that we've talked about for schools. So my name is Lexia Garcia, and I'm a senior at Lincoln High School. And first, I have a special request for you both. So in Providence, Rhode Island, the Providence Student Union requested that their public officials try out their high school's standardized kneecap test. And a few students in Portland were pretty moved by this action. And so members of the PPS and Portland Student Unions would like to request, respectfully request, that you, Governor Ketzopper, and you, Chief Education Officer Dr. Rudy Crew, as well as Deputy Superintendent Rob Saxton, 
the members of the Oregon Education Investment Board, the State Board of Education, both the Oregon House and Oregon Senate's Education Committees, the Oregon Business Association's Board, the Portland Business Alliance's Board, and our own PPS Board of Education, and anyone else who's interested, take the four High School Oak State Standardized Tests. <laughs> Yeah, or the Common Core State Standard Pilot Test, just to get an idea of what our students are facing in public schools today. Here's a question, what happens if we fail? <laughs> <laughs> then we're out, huh? You'll see if it should actually evaluate you. So with that... Well, I, if yeah. I'm going to be evaluated, I want to take it now and next year and see what growth I've made during the, <laughs> you know... <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, so with that, we would like to try to set up a time to see if we can make that happen. But I do I can't have speak for another the legislature, question. <laughs> but I'm happy to take the test. Would you have to take the test with me, Dr. Crew? All right. <laughs> okay, so I do have another question, though. So in drafting this question, I took the liberty to look into your high school experience, and I found that out of, the, out of 25 of the notable alumni on South Eugene's High School's Wikipedia page, 13 are recognized for their excellence in humanities. So your curriculum probably included funding for teachers, music, art, and other humanities, and most assuredly did not include funding for multiple state-mandated standardized tests. The Achievement Compacts... <laughs> so the Achievement Compacts, the Common Core, and soon the Common Core State Standards. So with that, how many of my alumni, or how will my alumni have a chance to look like your alumni when we're spending millions of dollars on standardized tests, the achievement compacts, and soon the Common Core State Standards, instead of on teachers and electives that can enhance and diversify a public school learning environment? So you asked that question about six different ways in the course of your statements. Very good. Message received. Um, so uh, there are, there, I think there's two parts to this. Uh, I, I think all of us agree that, uh, you know, you need some kind of common barometer for student uh, performance, but clearly it shouldn't come at the expense of, uh, of, of instructional time and, and squeeze out and just increase or, or, narrowing, or narrowing the curriculum. So how, how do we get there? Um, we do currently, federal law does require a testing for math and I think language arts in what, three through eight and 11. Uh, now we could, uh, I think when we get a little further down the road on our, our own evaluation system, uh, we could perhaps apply for a waiver, an addi additional federal waiver. So that's I think one, one avenue. We're stuck with the federal law until it's changed or we request a waiver, but I'm all about waivers. We've got healthcare waivers and NCLB waivers, so that's a possibility. We, we have reduced uh, modest, but uh, I think the number of Oaks uh, uh, assessments by about 10% in 2010, 2011 because of, of uh, legislation we passed last session. So um, your message is received loud and clear, and I think the question is how do we actually, uh, how do we actually move from where we are now to a more rational uh, system of evaluation that doesn't take uh, as much time and is actually more productive in terms of the outcomes for students. Uh, I was a little troubled only by one thing that you said, and that was that you want to look like the alumni of, like, of South Eugene High School, like myself, which means you spend 14 years and a lot of money going to school and becoming a medical doctor, then never use it. I'm not sure what kind of <laughs> utility that is. Great. So, did, okay. so I, I, I'm, you know, every time I come to these meetings, I always think to myself, you know, do I, do I try to get out safely? Um, with questions like this, um, so I I want to I want to uh, first of all I want to say that I don't I I think that we are at a point in time in the history of public education in this country where we have been essentially sort of in this knee jerk reaction that stems from federal mandates under No Child Left Behind. We essentially genuflected at that for the better part of two decades. In those two decades, everybody had to drink that Kool-Aid that was called statewide testing as a way of being able to measure student growth. The genesis of that was that there were large numbers of children for whom growth was, exact, was, was the exact opposite that was happening for them in schools. 
and the country essentially said, you know, we've got to really take a look at this question and see how we can instigate greater degrees of growth. He couldn't have picked a worse tool, could not have picked a, a, a more unintelligent use of a tool, um, in the sense that this is a high stakes, one-time test that essentially becomes a number the likes of which define what a student is in a school, or in some cases, in my case in Florida, it defines the whole school, an A, a B, a C, a D, or an F. What a sham that has been to public educators who really do understand that the real value of assessment is in being able to understand not just growth over time, but how a student ultimately can demonstrate that growth in a myriad of ways, and we ought to be moving more toward that sort of system where we are seeing multiple measures and multiple uh, ways by which students demonstrate their knowledge of this in the context of a more sane and civil and, if you will, educationally valuable assessment system. The, pro the problem is moving from where we were in this last iteration of maybe two decades, maybe even more, to what we think of as being a more sane and civil assessment process is noisy. It's going to be a very noisy process. People essentially are saying, largely, and we heard the students, I heard them all the way down in, in Salem, you know, stop testing us. And as the governor said, you know, we heard, heard it loud and clearly. But we're still under a requirement to do some testing. On the other hand, we're now in the process of trying to say, listen, we know that there's a better way of being able to do this and that there is a smarter way of being able to think about assessment in the hands of teachers who essentially examine ways by which students know something and how they've come to know it. And we want to ultimately ask through this legislative session through some of the initiatives that we're talking about here relative to, I don't know, it's off the table right now for discussion, but it's very much in my mind as a part of this, but we want to ask for the support to help teachers actually use new and different kinds of assessments as a way of being able to determine growth over time. Whether or not that will ever satisfy the, 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 the feds and, and all of that is a whole nother question. Many of them have their own point of view that this really has to be a standardized test. It has to be a test that has a, a number, a rubric, and a whole host of other things that make it a test that they legitimize and so on. I, you know, I can't speak to that. That remains to be part of the national discourse. But I can only tell you that Oregon is about to lead the way. We are on the cusp of being able to both ask and answer the question about how we shift to a more sane, civil, and effective, and, and, and ultimately more professional use of assessment, not only for understanding what students are growing, but how we as adults are growing as well. And to then be able to use that in a, in a meaningful way to drive uh, not only good instruction, but to really drive who wants to teach anymore. Because an awful lot of people look at this and think this is teaching by the numbers, right? I, 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 and I didn't sign up to do that. So I would just simply say to you, I think you're right about, you know, sort of raising the question. I don't, I don't, I, I'm not one of these people who's an anti-test people. I do believe that there is a reason to test someone. I don't think that, I think we have just gone completely crazy with test mania and we have no real value for even what we get when we do test it. The numbers are, are, are in many cases, almost useless, um, and people are trying to make huge decisions about this, and sadly, in some cases, they make decisions about whether a school is a good school or a bad school by that. So we just have to kind of shift our brain to thinking about a new and different way of being able to do this work. Thank you. We're now gonna move on to the part um, where we get to take questions from you, our audience. Again, a reminder that we're taking written questions, only written questions, so please write them down and wave them around if you have a question that you wanna make sure to get answered. Remember, write your name on it if you'd like it addressed, addressed back to you specifically. Um, we're doing this in an effort to try to get through as many as we possibly can so that we can move through them, find similar themes. Um, and I'd like to introduce our student panel this evening. We have four students here. Um, we have Deja Brooks for Wilson High School. We have Marty Berger from Lincoln High School, and we have Andrew Davidson from Grant High School, and Nyak Tron here from Madison High School. <laughs> 
Three of them are members of the Superintendent Student Advisory Committee, also referred to as SuperSAC. We thank you for joining us this evening. They will be reading the questions and helping filter through the questions and organize them. Um, and just a reminder that we'll also take questions from Facebook. Um, if you are streaming us on or live, um, or if you've already submitted one, we will get some from there. So with that, I will turn it over to the students. Oh. Hi, Mr. Governor Kizabur, and hi, everybody. Thanks for being here today and at Madison High School. So I have a question. Like, can you please comment on the need to increase vocational and technical schools? Uh, yeah, let me again, I'll just make a quick comment and hand it over to, to Rudy. This is uh, extraordinarily important. Obviously, it's a function of resources, as you know. Uh, but um, I think for too long, not only do we need to increase those kind of CTE opportunities, but we need to get rid of what I think has been a, a sort of an artificial distinction between CTE and STEM. Uh, they are both critical pathways to, uh, to a career, uh, which is really what this is all about. And we know that in this economy there are significant jobs that are going unfilled uh, that would probably be filled if young people had access or exposure to those jobs through those kinds of programs. I'm actually speaking tomorrow morning at the, to a group of employers who are actually seeking to provide those connections, school-to-work connections. We have some resources in uh, the budget uh, to, to try to address that as part of our target investments, but this needs to be a, a major um, a commitment as a, uh, a, a, an offering in our public school system if we truly want to meet our 4420 objectives and ensure that all of our kids have a pathway to, uh, to the middle class. One of the things that I, I'm really very glad for your question because I think that we have for a very long time in this country really understood um, or at least thought that if you didn't go to college, you really, you really didn't have an opportunity to be um, employed and that frankly you weren't capable. Somehow or another we actually associated the absence of, of, uh, of, of going directly to college right out of high school or something as being something that was uh, for unintelligible, non-college bound students. And I, 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 I wanna say, A, I don't think necessarily everybody has to go to college. B, I think those people who want to and those people who actually know enough about what they think they, they wanna do should have that choice. And that what we have to do is prepare, um, we have to start laying out a new set of, if you will, sort of lanes in schools, roads, highways, call them pathways, whatever you want to call them, but a way that everybody has an opportunity to see themselves as being both gainfully employed, gainfully employable, and learned, and smart, and capable, and confident. And I would argue that this one-track system does not get us there. That high schools that essentially say it's one way or the highway does not get us there. Schools that say, you know what, there's only one way of being able to demonstrate your smarts, your capabilities, don't get us there. So we're having to really finally, and I'm glad to say, embrace vocational programming, CTE opportunities, internships, externships, community-based learning, all these different things represent new pathways that we are really trying to very quickly put in place to be able to give students the opportunity to go through and find their dreams desired, you know, their life, their life's dream. So my hope would be that we'd see many more opportunities in these schools, that you'd see this, the dollars that we're putting aside now as a part of the initiative money to give us models for what that could look like in the middle school, in the high school, some of them related to STEM, some of them related to CTE and, and STEM, some of them related to the arts, there just can be any number of ways, but all I do know is that there is no one best system. There is no one highway that is gonna meet the needs of every single student and the aspirations and the dreams they hold for themselves. Thank you for answering me. Thank you, sir. This next question comes from Kayoshi Taylor Mays. With almost 50% of students eligible to receive free and reduced lunch, 
how do you realistically propose to have a 100% graduation rate without first addressing the issue of poverty and the ability for families to meet their basic needs? You know, son, I cannot see your name because I am old. I'm sorry. Kiyoshi. Kiyoshi. Hi, hi. Oh, so it's your question? Thank you very much, Kiyoshi. But I was trying to see this young man's n n n Marty. Thank you, Marty. And thank you, Kiyoshi. And stop yelling at me. I can hear you all the way up here. <laughs> Marty, I appreciate you rating her question, but at least having this on the floor. So when I came to Oregon, one of the things that I did was to um, start really looking at things that I would have been concerned with if I had gone into another big urban school system someplace in America. Detroit, again, New York City, or wherever it may be. And one of the things that I found that was fascinating, and that we are gonna have to really sort of grapple with this as a state, is exactly your question, which is what's the relationship between poverty and learning? And there are really important questions embedded in that that have to do with exactly the, co the conversation we were just having about how do kids get what they need in order to be able to be in the school? How do they avoid being absent from school? How do they get the dental care that they need to be on time and able to come and function in school? The food that they need in their families, the sustenance that they need, all of that is an economic question. And for too long, the educational questions have existed on the one side of the ledger and the, and the, and the, and the, and the economic questions existed on the other. We now live in a time when we aren't able to see them as separate questions at all. We actually have to start thinking about them in an integrated, collaborative way. And that's why when I came here and I saw where we stand with our poverty index in this state, I was frankly blown away. I would never have guessed that. And largely, it's rural poor. It is largely rural poor, huge urban poor, but it's, and that I knew about. But it's also very densely rural poor as well. So how we then build reading programs, how we use technology as a way of being able to reach and be in the communities that need these services, how we wrap around a lot of those services from healthcare to vision, screening, food, and, and, and other kinds of resources and human service, that's why I came here, because at least in this model that we're in right now, for all the ills that it still may have, but in this model, it is contemplated that these agencies have to talk with each other, share resources, create new and different ideas about how to respond to them. There's no family in this state that if they're hungry and their children are not well fed prior to coming to school, that they will be able to do what we're talking about vis-a-vis 40-40-20. This is not happening. So we've got to be able to really see this as a holistic approach to community building that then has a whole lot of implications for student building. Just to add one, some, one thing really quickly, um, I just want you to start thinking about it because there's another side of this handshake. If we create this amazingly well-educated workforce, let's say we hit our 40, 40, 20 goals. If we don't, think under, if we don't rethink our fundamental economic paradigm, there aren't going to be the jobs for those young people to fill. Uh, we lost seven and a half million jobs during the Great Recession, we, and 50% and of those jobs paid between thirty and $60,000 a year. We've gained about 47% of those back, and only 2% of them pay between thirty and $60,000 a year. Uh, what we've lost is uh, people who are taken out by automation, by technology, uh, the millennial generation, 36% of the workforce today, 50% in 2020, a lot of them are working at Starbucks, a lot of them are working at jobs that didn't require the kind of training that they had. So the other side of this conversation, which I'm going to really start pushing over the next year, is we're going to have to not let down at all and making sure that there's a direct relationship between family stability and poverty and hunger and ed educational attainment. But we also have to make sure, if we're going to make this huge effort to train our, 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 our young people, that we have an economy that's turning out the kind of jobs, not just in urban Oregon, but urban and rural Oregon, that actually can give them the kind of income they need to live a middle class lifestyle. Thank you. So as we go on, I just want to remind folks, we really do want to read as many questions as we can. So the applause, I know, is just short. But if we could hold the applause so we can try to get through it. And if I could ask the governor and Dr. Crew 
um, to be succinct with your answers so we can get through as many. That, that would be great. I don't want to cut it short if it's a thorough answer, but we do want to get to as many as we can. Andrew. Why is there so little emphasis on reducing class sizes? I teach English in a public high school. I have 42 students in my classes. Yeah, why? Not enough money. That's succinct enough? <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, wh why, why is there not more emphasis, though? Not more emphasis on... Re on reducing class sizes. On reducing class sizes. Well, I think there is a, there's a great deal of emphasis on re reducing class sizes. That is obviously one of the reasons we need to recapitalize our system of public education. We need to be hiring teachers, not laying teachers off. We need to actually have the resources to, uh, to ensure that, uh, that we have appropriate class sizes. I think that uh, whether you're on the tag end or whether you're looking at the, some of the students that are the furthest behind, we're going to have to have increasingly customized teaching to reach those 40, 40, 20 goals. And you can't do that in a large class size. So uh, again, um, I, I think that's one we hear and we know. I think the real issue it really does get down to uh, a, a resource question, and that's why uh, we're engaged in a really, hopefully, very strategic effort to uh, to uh, fundamentally re reinvest in our in our entire system of public education. Thank you. This question was sent in by Deborah Clemens. I'm absolutely a PPS supporter with two kids at SS and Grant. I want to see more money for K through 12 because the education of our kids is critical to our future and theirs. But I'm very worried that higher education won't get its due. Education, educating our kids doesn't end at 12th grade. How can my family afford college if increased cost of tuition, fees, books, is on the backs of a young adults and families, and if Oregon's public universities keep increasing tuition? How does Oregon plan to invest in pre-K through 20 education? I think that um, when we've talked about this issue, uh, and first of all, whoever it is that asks the question, you're, it's a spot on question because we, when the governor said that we've basically, you know, sort of not invested in this across the board, he's absolutely true, and that's particularly true in higher ed. But when we think about a solution to it, you have to think about this in multiple, in multiple layers or multiple years. And so the first cut of this obviously is going to be trying to put as much money in the, in the total education bucket as we possibly can, and I think that's what is being discussed right now. And secondly, it's going to be a matter of being able to really look at issues of tuition costs, the rising cost overall of going to college or post any two-year or four-year institution, and then what is it that we need to do both in the realm of providing scholarship dollars or, if you will, uh, aid dollars uh, uh, that help students get over the initial hump of at least seeing uh, the first one or two years as being eligible, uh, them being eligible to actually uh, 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 complete. One of the things that we're hoping is that we'll see greater numbers of students who can actually acquire credit while they're in high school, essentially deferring that first year's cost. So the greater are those opportunities, the more students would be able to avail themselves of those opportunities and thus have fewer dollars that they have to commit to first year college, the first year, or even for that matter, in many cases, the second year. So we're literally looking at where and how we can put the dollars in the most meaningful places where students would be able to get post-secondary, if you will, um, both credit and then ultimately dollars to support their, their, uh, their, their tuition costs. Go ahead with the next question. Hi. Uh, government, the capital of our education system, the condition of our school buildings do not get a lot of public attention. How can the state help make the investments we need to make in energy in earthquake safety and in 21st century learning environments that our students deserve? Well, I'll just try it because the capital side of this has actually been rather interesting to me because every place I've ever worked, we had huge numbers of state capital dollars as a way of being able to you know, develop schools, clean them up, maintain them, make sure that they were essentially earthquake proof and so on and so forth, or tornado proof as the case may be. Um, 
I, I do think that there's going to have to be some prioritization as we think about money coming into public education for both capital side and the program side. We've, at least in my mind so far, most of the conversation has been about how to improve program, how to expand it, how to provide it, how to get some of the, the things that we aren't able to provide now or providing at a high cost, how to get those things uh, under, 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 under wraps. Um, but when you talk about the capital side, the buildings itself, the lighting itself, the more efficient use of and the more ecological use, frankly, of, uh, of different kinds of, um, uh, of, 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 of building materials and, and, and lighting and so forth, it really is going to come down to a state having a capital plan for this. And that capital plan has to ultimately be in concert with a district capital plan and that I'm aware of, I'm sure districts have that for themselves, but it is in many cases not a, a, a matter of, you know, a tremendous amount of dollars that the state puts towards that, at least as I understand it at this juncture. We do have our Cool Schools program that we started two years ago. I think there are 19 school districts that are taking advantage of that. So essentially what we're doing is coming in and doing your energy efficiency retrofit that then is, is paid for by future energy, energy savings. And we're essentially, it's a very data intensive process because we want to prove up that what we want to do is, is, is uh, get institutional capital and private equity capital into that and really scale it up. And so I think that's a very promising possibility. Uh, AFT actually nationally has put some of their pension money into this because they think this is actually a pretty good investment. So uh, we are beginning to turn the, the corner, I think, on the energy efficiency side of this uh, problem. What should be prioritized at the state level to ensure that the most effective teachers are hired and retained in every district? I think a priority should go to how we essentially provide some kind of a network to support teachers in how they, <clears throat> excuse me, and how they get to do their work. People do not want to come into any profession where they are not going to receive the tools to be good at what they want to do. It's just that simple. And we have walked away from that responsibility for year and year and year and years prior and hopefully not in the future. But the first thing that I would prioritize is create a network that essentially provides opportunities for people to really get the kind of feedback, a teacher to teacher feedback. Secondly, provide opportunities for them to have a mentor. Someone who is a teacher who may even teach their own grade level or their own content area, and they then can have an opportunity to really learn from someone, particularly as they're new coming into the profession. Thirdly, give opportunities for us to really bring in, <coughs> excuse me, bring in universities and other institutions and other, other partners who frankly have something to say about this and relation, the relationship between the services of the universities and other, other institutions and the training, or if you will, the, the practitioners work in their day to day, that relationship is a really powerful relationship if in fact it's built. I would argue right now it's very, very episodic, it's very fragile, doesn't, in some cases it doesn't exist at all, um, and people are essentially brought in, they start teaching and they're on their own. The enemy of really effective, high quality growth of teachers is isolation is people trying to do the best that they can do, but they have absolutely no one there to help them, no resource available to them to be able to make sense out of things like new assessments and you know, all the other things that are coming down the pike. Thank you. This is from Susan, a PPS parent. When I've gone to the Capitol to advocate for, uh, for adequate funding, I see a lot of professional education lobbyists, but not parents. Do you think that parents can actually make a difference in Salem? Yeah, I actually think they, they can. I mean, uh, uh, I've been around a long time, and some of the education lobbyists that were there when I left are still there, and uh, they, do a, they do a great job. But I do think they are, they are seen as education lobbyists, just like the lobbyists for the Oregon Medical Association is seen as the lobbyists for the Oregon Medical Association. I think to some extent they're seen as association uh, representatives, and, and that's not a pejorative statement, but I think the more actual parents can come down and tell their personal stories and, and make the, the, the need for funding real and human, put a face on it, uh, I think that uh, is extraordinarily effective. Thank you. 
Your budget identifies education as a key area of investment that is currently underfunded. underfunded. How will the new proposed educational govern governance structure address the problem of underinvestment? Well, um, let me take a real quick cut of this and hand it to Rudy. It, I don't think the, the structure itself directly affects underfunding. What it's seeking to do is to intentionally, both in funding and in policy, recognize the connection and the relationship between early childhood nutrition uh, and uh, kindergarten readiness, kindergarten readiness and third grade reading, the relationship between third grade reading and, and you know, ready for college in ninth grade and, and, and the relationship between that and degree attainment and degree attainment and, and economic opportunity. So it's trying to get us out of the silos. It's trying to actually get more uh, people around the table. I will just say that the idea of a regional uh, achievement compact is to essentially, let's say, go to the Central Oregon and get not just the school districts, but the community college, the branch university campus, the business communities, the faith communities, the community-based organizations, all to basically make a commitment. What, what is their commitment going to be to achieve a common, common set of goals? So uh, indirect, uh, it's, it's, it's more about coordination and, and alignment, I think, than, than really funding. Yeah, I, I would just simply say that the part of the problem has been is just exactly what I was talking about with teachers working in isolation is that we've actually asked the schools to do it all. All of it. Make sure my kid gets up, make sure my kid does well, make sure my kid comes, uh, graduates from school, make sure my kid is eligible to go to XYZ place after school, uh, make sure that there's somebody available that can actually watch him or her until I can get off from work. All of those things. There's not an illegitimate request really from a parent. It's just that the schools can't do it all on their own. And we are so reluctant to try to say that. Every teacher, every principal, every superintendent thinks that somehow or another they can make this dollar stretch across every one of those needs, and they cannot. Even in the best of years, they cannot. And so what we find is that there is now a need for us to actually say, let's admit that we can't do it all alone. We have to work with partners. We need to have other people wrap their services in a thoughtful way around the needs of families and children and neighborhoods. And the degree to which we're able to do that is going to have an awful lot of impact on not just the budget, but it's going to have an awful lot of impact on students and their own growth and their development as well. The question were submitted originally in Spanish form land K8. So is there a strategy to reduce the level of bullying in schools or online? Is there a strategy bullying. For, for, for bullying? Is that what he said? You know, I think this is, this is one of these areas where I know that this, the, uh, the districts and super, certainly superintendents and school boards have had um, an awful lot of conversation um, about this as it relates to bullying that's happening uh, in cyberspace, bullying that's happening in, um, in their schools. Um, obviously now there's starting to be federal attention being paid to this and that federal attention is going to draw down, if you will. Um, on districts and uh, localities to actually start making sure that there are policies about this and that there are real teeth and consequences to uh, people who participate in any form of, of bullying overall. The place where I go with this personally is I honestly think that we actually have to start talking about not so much just bullying, although that's an obvious uh, outcome, but we have to really start talking about personal and civic literacy. Now, what does it mean to be a human being and how do I exchange myself as a person in the context of my community or in my school? We don't talk about those things. You're, we're getting bullying in large measure in my mind because we actually have allowed all behaviors to essentially ride. They get, they get a pass. And in my judgment, too many of those behaviors over too long a period of time have gone unchecked. And now we're seeing the most perverse form of them and the saddest of consequences as a result. 
So I, I think both at a state level, certainly at the state board, I know that they've uh, taken action in this regard. I know that local boards have as well. But I think the approach to this is not necessarily just to focus on the outgrowth of it, but to really deal with the core issues of how do people feel about themselves in the con and how do they learn to manage themselves in a way that leaves all of that antisocial, ugly, heinous behavior uh, to the side and is really and it's really completely eliminated from schools and and um, and the community at large. Thank you. So before we move on to our last question, this will be our last question. If you have a question that you um, submitted and it, the topic area didn't get covered, or you have another question as you've been listening um, tonight, um, there the governor has brought his citizen liaison team. If you if you're part of that team, can you raise your hand so people know how to connect with you? So if you connect with them and get them your question, they will get you a response for your question. So we don't want to leave the responses undone. It's been a very engaging conversation, so we thank you. But this will be our last question um, for the night for the panel. And then again, if you have an additional question, make sure you connect with um, the governor's citizen liaison team to get that answered. This final question comes from Amy. Governor, your approach to healthcare has valued freeing resources to invest in prevention. Do you foresee being able to invest education dollars in successful models like Open Meadow that identify kids at risk of dropping out and are effective of getting them to graduation and post-secondary success? Absolutely. I think that is a, is, a, is a remarkable model. And there's actually models around the state that are doing incredible. NIA is a great, another great example of a, of a, of a school that's uh, really bending the, the, bending the curve. So I think we have to be very open to a variety. When I, when I said at the very beginning, we need to meet these young people where they are, it means we're not all going to meet them in the same place or the same way. And um, I think that really is what we're striving to do. At the end of the day, what we're trying to do is create a pathway to success for every young person in the state of Oregon. And I think we have to, be, uh, uh, have, to have the courage and the flexibility to evolve our thinking about what that looks like. So uh, uh, yes. Great. Thank you. So I would like to thank Governor Kitzhaber and Dr. Crew for joining us here today. And I'd also like to thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, when we think about the room full of people here and who they represent who weren't able to join us tonight, please remember that your voices are important, that this is a community engagement. Public education is our education. Um, so please make sure that your voices are heard. And again, I want to thank our legislative representatives who were here this evening for joining us as well. Thank you all. Our next board meeting is Monday, April 1st at 6 o'clock in the board auditorium at BESC. Thank you. <laughs>